Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone today? Good. 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 All right. This morning we are going to continue with our testify series, and James Bond has volunteered or agreed to give his testimony this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to him. <coughs> I've got notes to talk about myself. It's <laughs> <laughs> being in front of people does too. Uh, so testimony is partly talking about your life. So I'll start at the beginning. I was born um, in 1992. I'll spare you the month. Um, and some interesting things about that, though, even because when I was born, I couldn't breathe, and I came out, I was all sort of blue and black and whatnot. Um, I was, you know, the doctors were able to do something. I, remember. I, I wasn't actually cognitive at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't really remember um, exactly what they did, but you know, it's a secondhand knowledge for me. Um, but I mean, that and stuff, it's, it's my life I can be thankful for. I mean, it didn't have to happen. It did. Uh, I was sort of graceful in that, right? Sort of if I was born in another age, 500 years ago, maybe it wouldn't have happened. But, um, and my early life, I mean, you know, I mean, I'll say this, you know, some people have testimonies that are very sort of dramatic, right? You know, that there's horrible things that happen, and then I was saved, and, you know, black and white, right? And for me, it was kind of like that, but my life was a little more boring, so sorry about that. But, um, you know, I grew up in a stable home. Uh, parents never divorced or anything. All my other friends I knew their parents were getting divorced and it was not good for them, but that's never happened. Um, stable, comfortable, not too wealthy, but can do bad things for you too. Um, and it was just kind of there, all right? Um, early in life, before I was saved, the whole, you know, sort of scriptural reference to an eye for an eye really had a lot of relevance for me, right? Um, in preschool, I was the big bully on campus. Uh, I, th I think that's relevant. It, it is. It, you know, was, there was a time in my life when I was this huge bully, I and mean, people like that sort of find it hard to believe. I you know, tend to be more quiet than not. But um, yeah, I was the bully. Uh, I would see kids playing with their cars or whatever, and you're, you're driving it backwards. That doesn't actually happen, right? Um, car goes forward not backward, you need to do it right, and then they would not want to do it my way, and so I'd be, um, that's just how it works. Because um, they, they got to learn how to do this right, and that, now I TA at the university, and I'm telling people how to do history right, so maybe that's, uh, maybe nothing's changed, I don't know. <laughs> if they don't do it my way, they, they fail, so. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I was, I was the playground boy, and I, I remember, snapshots from even being in preschool way back then. I'm only 23, I guess I'm still young enough to remember. But, um, but yeah, so I spent that year sort of being the, the bully. My mom, you know, knew about this and sort of said, well, you know, it's because you grew up in a hill with no other friends and it doesn't have social life. No, I remember that. It's because I thought they were doing it wrong. I was a bully. There's, there's no other explanation for it. Um, and then I spent the next couple of years going into elementary school getting bullied, right? What goes around comes around. Um, and that's an eye for an eye, you know, God says, uh, vengeance, vengeance is mine, I'll repay it, right? That sort of held some, <clears throat> held some water for me back then, I guess. But um, on June 20th, 2001, I was at a uh, vacation Bible school, so I would have been, do some math, nine years old. Um, and me and two other kids, sort of at the end of that week, decided to, you know, sort of do the altar call fashion, you know, who wants to be saved? And, we sort of decided, yeah, yeah. I decided, you know, that, that sounds good to me, right? You know, I'll, I'll do that. And I mean, looking back on it, it, it's it's that's always a hard date for me because it's hard to tell whether I was actually saved on that day or not because I don't really remember too much about that day. And what I do remember was not really having any friends and other people are doing it, so maybe I should too, right? Um, and that's not to bash the whole all they're called kind of salvation model, but. Um, that was my experience. However, um, shortly after that time, I met um, <coughs> still in elementary school, and I, I'm, he's still arguably my best friend. He lives in Boston now, but we're still good buds, right? 
um, I didn't know what a Mormon was at that time, but he grew up and was part of the LDS church. And, but, you know, we sort of hung out, and the verse talks about, you know, iron sharpens the iron, so a man sharpens the count, and so that's fair and great. Um, that held relevance then, too. I mean, we would, we would talk about things. That, you know, we're playing like kids always do, but we talk about stuff, you know. Well, who is God, you know? Who's this Jesus guy, right? Um, and at the time, when we came to realize that we both had basically the same idea about God, about Jesus. I had grown up, you know, any of you know what a wanting club is, right? I had grown up doing that. Um, so I, I knew all the basic, you know, gospel tenets, you know, who is Jesus, who is God, he loves you, and he is just. And, um, but I found that we basically had the, we had basically had the same idea, right? And um, years after, I've always thought about that, and now he's come to the place where he, you know, he's, I mean, he's way smarter than me, he can run circles around me, he's doing that um, doctor program at Harvard for files a year or something. He knows more about my own history than I do, um, stuff that I study. But, um, and he's now coming to question that, you know, because once you grow up in the LDS church, you come to learn more and more about sort of the culture side of it, right? You know, once you started learning these things, it's like, okay, um, maybe this isn't what I believe. And he's still, I still pray for him. He's still kind of struggling with that a little bit. But even in high school, we would talk, and we, we basically had the same idea about God. And... Um, and I guess I've come to look at the verse that talks about, you know, at the, in the end times there, there's goats and sheep, right? And God says to those, you know, certain of the goats who say, you know, that we've cried out to you, Lord, Lord, you know, why are we among those who are being cast out? We've cried out to you, Lord, Lord. And God says, you know, I never knew you. Be gone from my presence, right? And I think conversely, there can be those who maybe don't use the name of Jesus, but know Jesus. Right, and that, that's sort of spoken to me about you know if you have the right Jesus, you can call him whatever you want, but you've got to have the right Jesus about the relationship, not about sort of this whatever what you call him. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, the only true way to refer to God is by Jehovah, right? Well, but do you have the real God? You know, I mean, do you have the real Jesus in mind when you're using that language? Right, language is powerful, but. I mean, it's about having a relationship with the actual <laughs> spiritual person, the God, the real God, right? And for me, I mean, you know, we're not to judge who is saved and who's not, but I mean, for me, that was always kind of like, yeah, I mean, he grew up in this sort of setting, but he had the right idea. And now when he's confronted with different ideas than what he knew was right, he's not okay with that, right? Um, it always spoke to me because I'm sort of someone who likes to think in terms of like symbols, allegories, literature, that sort of thing. And, and it always spoke to me to, to remind me that, you know, I need to go beyond the trappings. You know, I need to go beyond just sort of, you know, showing up at church, right? And sort of saying I'm Christian, going through the, even doing the right thing. You know, I mean, I, you know, both of us in the group were very big on, you know, sort of doing right, you know, not doing what the Bible says is wrong. And that's good, that's important, but, I mean, you know, God says, you know, all, all our righteousness is as filthy rags, right, if we don't have Jesus, if we don't have God. So, um, it always reminds me, too, that, I mean, there's stories of tribes in Africa, right, when the missionaries would come 150, 200 years ago and preach the gospel to them, right, much as we hear today. And at the end of this, you know, the tribes would say, well, you're not telling us anything new. You're telling us nothing. Right, um, we, we, we know this. I mean, this is something that we've always known as a people. Um, I mean, the Bible says, you know, those who call, cry out to God, you know, He will reveal themselves to them, right? You know, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, and, you know, the, that reminds us too, I mean, the Bible is the living and breathing word of God, right? But it's not God. We don't, we shouldn't worship that thing, right? And for me, I mean, I like to think, again, more, more symbolic terms, intellectual terms, and that's hard for me sometimes, because, you know, I grew up, and I, I just love scripture. I, I read it, and you can love it too much, you know, and you can sort of read too much into it, right? you got to let God speak through you in a spiritual as well as an intellectual sense. Um, so, yeah, that, that was what sort of my friend taught me, right? You know, sort of more or less through experience. Um, yeah, and again, I go back and forth on whether that date, which for a very long time actually was my salvation date or not, because I remember times after that when I did cry out to God and I'd say, 
no, I'm nothing before you, right? You know, I am completely sinful, completely nothing, right? Um, you're everything. And I remember times after that when I would do that. But that day, I don't know. I mean, I don't remember too much about it, to be honest. And more and more as I've grown in my walk with God, um, that day has come to have less and less significance for me. It's a month and a string of numbers, right? Um, what's important is a relationship with God. Amen. Relying on him. Yeah. Um, and then also, God has sort of shown me more and more what he sounds like, I guess. And that might sound weird for some. But uh, in, in high school, I was a sophomore in high school, and I'd always define myself according to what I do. And that's still something I struggle with a lot of pride. Um, and, you know, the one thing that I'd always done up to that point was play music, trumpet, right? I was, I was the trumpet player, I was a trumpet guy, and everybody knew me as that. Um, and in high school, I'd had braces for a couple of years, and I don't know if any of you play brass, but that's a very debilitating, especially if you've got a little mouthpiece, right? That, that can be a very debilitating addition to your embouchure. Um, I'd had braces for a couple of years, and I'd sort of accommodated myself to it. And in high school, um, in my freshman year, I as a freshman, which didn't really happen too often, I um, auditioned into the top jazz band. We had two jazz bands at that time. I auditioned into the top, and I was doing really well. And I was walking <coughs> to class one day, and I felt God tell me, you know what, you need to quit band. And it is, you know, I mean, I, you know, at, at that point, I kind of had this idea that God speaks through, uh, you know, the heavens open, and, you know, there's <laughs> angels flying everywhere, and you, James, you know, you know, <laughs> go to China or something, you know, <laughs> right now, you're going to go to China, and, you know, but it was just sort of this idea that came into my head, you, you know what, you need to quit band, and it wasn't just, a, I don't know, it's hard to describe, I mean, for me, it wasn't just sort of, you know, the string of ideas that come and go throughout the day, it was something that stuck, right, and it seemed to come from outside of myself, you need to quit band, and I was like, that's ridiculous, I mean, I'm doing so good right now, I mean, I'm, I'm the man, right, you know, why, why would I do that, uh, that's, that's ridiculous. So I didn't, and then after that, um, my playing got progressively worse. Um, and sometimes, you know, God knows how to speak to us where we're at. I thought in symbolic terms, playing gets progressively worse. That means something, right? Um, and I was a senior in high school, and I'd still managed to become sort of the best trumpet player that we had. Now, that being said, we'd always lose our competitions. It was <coughs> absolutely mean a whole lot. But, um, and I was thinking about, well, I'm going to go to college. Well, there's one thing that I've always done, which is music. So I'll go and be a music major, I'll play trumpet. And I've always been in school, so I will go and be a music education major and plan on teaching high school. <clears throat> so I did that in the first year of college. I mean, it was just awful. I mean, you know, I really got to get a full picture of just how bad I was compared, maybe not at that school because they were sort of hurting for brass players, but. Um, and I was okay there, but <laughs> compared to the rest of the world of trumpet playing, when I, I, I got a real sense of, you know, just how low I really was in that total pool. And, I mean, and, and that was hard for me, because I'd always been used to being number one in everything, right? Um, at least thinking that I was. And, um, and for that year, I practiced really, really hard and always, you know, spend hours in the practice room trying and just would get worse. I mean, it really wouldn't get any better, it'd get worse. In my sophomore year, second year, um, I was taking, I was playing, I wanted to study abroad, and I chose Costa Rica because that would actually be cheaper than a semester at the school I was going to, even with all the scholarships and stuff. And um, I wanted to learn Spanish, I figured that's good to be a teacher in California in Spanish. And I wanted to go somewhere. You know, my brother, you know, there's always this kind of comparison thing. I was the younger brother, and, you know, he had gone to Europe several times in college and after, you know, he went to Africa and did all these things. I'm like, what have I done? I'm going to, you know, he went to Stanford, and I'd always compare myself to that. And I was point Loma Nazarene, you know, no one's ever heard of it. Um, and so I always had this kind of comparison thing that was going on with that. Um, but I was thinking about sort of, you know, studying abroad and that kind of thing. But that semester I was trying to take, I was taking like 12 classes, now a lot of these little one units, right? But I was taking all these classes to try and, you know, sort of cover for that time that I'd be gone and losing units, right? So 
I mean, as a hard semester anyway, but I mean, my, my playing was also, I was really just getting progressively worse. And I, you know, I'd have this horrible stage fright. I couldn't ditch it. I figured after a year of being in college and doing this thing, you'd think that I'd be over it, right? You know, I'd be able to get up on stage and I'd have my hands shaking around. I couldn't do it. And so finally I was, I had gotten out of a particularly bad, bad practice session. And I finally prayed to God. I said, you know, what, what do you want me to do? I give this thing to you. I mean, it's yours. I don't care. Anymore. Well, what do you want, right? And he said, stop being a music major, go be a history major. And again, it was one of those things that he had be, been sort of training me up to that point to recognize, like, what, um, what his voice sounded like. But the summer before that year, I, I went back home and I'd been working out with honeybees. And um, just kind of an interesting job. You get stung a lot. But, um, <laughs> and I drove, drive my car down the road. And it was the weirdest thing for a long time. I couldn't figure out know why. I mean, I kind of came to the realization, maybe this is God doing this, but, um, and I'd have to turn left down this dirt road, and there's some trees or something blocking the way, so you couldn't see what was coming down the dirt road until you actually turned. And for like a two or three week period, consistently, every time, if there was a car coming down that road, before I got to the point where I could see the car coming, I had this feeling like, there's a car coming. And then I turned straight up, there's a car, and then I didn't have that feeling, there'd be no car coming, right? And it was just one of those random things, like, that doesn't save my life, that doesn't do anything. What, what is that? that that's, that's so weird, you know, I mean, I thought it was weird, but people think it's weird, right? But um, I came to the realization, again, that's just, you know, that was kind of God, I think, just trying to tell me, you know, here's what I sound like, you know, here's what it sounds like to hear from me, you know, so when it actually does matter, you won't mistake it. And that was kind of that moment my sophomore when he said that, again, I mean, Again, music was this thing I always held to and clung to and said, this is who I am and define myself by and God said, you need to get rid of that. No more, right? You define yourself by who you are, by who you are in me, right? In God and Jesus, not by what you do, right? And that was the hardest thing for me. I, I cried about it, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, it's very difficult and people in the music department, they didn't want, want to see that happen. They tried to convince me. I don't like, no, this is, this is what I gotta do. Um, and it's also kind of speaks to, I think, for me at least, um, sometimes God speaks in what we would conceive as being irrational ways, or tells us to do things that we see as being irrational, and sometimes it makes sense. Um, I mean, history had always kind of been on the back burner as maybe a second choice for me, but I decided not to do that. It's like, historians, people are stodgy, um, they are washed up, and like, why would I do that? Um, but it made a lot more sense for me. I mean, I was much more prepared. I was a much better writer than I was a musician. I was a much better reader back in high school. I got a lot better doing those sorts of things than I did with playing music, right? So sometimes it, it is rational. Sometimes it makes sense. Um, and for me, that's often more often, more often the case than not. And a lot of times I want to choose the irrational path because it feels a certain way or whatever. And God's like, no, you know what? This makes sense. You do this. Um, so that was kind of my pit of despair in God speaking to me in that moment time of my life, I guess, but, um, <coughs> then I went to Coast Creek, and that was a very good experience, and then I came back, and I solidified my decision to major in history at this point, and my playing has never been the same, it got much better whenever I was part of a group, I mean, it was much better than it had ever been before, so this got, that, again, for me, that was kind of God confirming, like, you know, this was me speaking, you did the right thing, um, still speaking in my domain, like some symbolic mind, right? Um, and then in college too, I want to point out that you know, Lauren and I should, that's my wife now, if you don't know. Uh, we started dating in high school, and you know, within a couple of weeks, we started to, yeah, this is the one we were both sort of kind of people that didn't really date or anything like that, and then she was the first person I dated. Um, and again, I mean, God just sort of spoke through both of us and said, you know, we're going to get married. Um, not right now, but I mean, this is going to happen. And, you know, there's something to be said for God speaking to us individually, but also communally, right? You know, if we sort of agree on something like that, and that God has spoken to us and told us roughly the same thing. As a community, uh, even a community of two, I mean, the, you know, there's something to be said for that as well. And, you know, I went through college and, you know, we sort of weighed in, that was hard. But um, I got kept this faithful, and then we got married last summer and came up here. Um, and again, that was another time when God spoke to me because my senior year of college, I knew I wanted to 
uh, go on and do a uh, graduate degree in history, right? I decided, sort of decided against, you know, teaching K through 12. I wanted to try and teach college. And, um, I mean, the, the college application process is hard enough. Graduate school is worse because it's far more heavily based on luck more than anything. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, scores and whatnot too. But, and again, I came to another one of those points where I was just sort of despairing. You know, I mean, I've got all these schools. I mean, you know, I got to think about you know, she does horses, and you know, I got to think about that. Find a partner that's going to be good at the same time. And it's all these schools. I mean, which one do I pick? Which one's going to even work out? Oh, this is going to work out. Then what do I do? Um, and again, you know, when I found the web page for the University of Montana, I just sort of had this piece, right? And then other people in my life sort of said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for you. And that was, I felt, I felt like, again, that was God, you know, speaking to me. Maybe, you know, not telling me to do something because I was going to apply to that school anyway, but just sort of giving me peace, right? And it ended up being that was the only school that actually gave me a real package, right? You know, come here. So he sort of confirms these things on how what his voice sounds like in our lives, right? It sounds different for everybody, but, um, but you know, sometimes we get this notion that if God's speaking to me, it's gonna be this great big grand moment, and there's gonna be angels fighting demons, and they're gonna come and do something. You know, it's a small, quiet, still place, right? Um, and so now we're here, and I've, that my first year of the master's program is two years, so I'm in the second year now. Um, and it's great, I love history better than I ever loved music, but more importantly, I mean, I've come more and more to see that as something I do for God rather than something I do for people or for myself, right? Uh, whatever that means, I don't know yet. Um, I'm still kind of in the process of figuring that out, right? He's showing me what that means, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so for me, that was, that was sort of a huge, struggle that I had, right, and to find myself according to the wrong God of this world as opposed to the God of the universe of salvation, right. Um, the other thing I've always really struggled with, is anybody else wants to pray for, um, is pride is a continual downfall, right, you know, I, I still get to thinking that I'm really something, you know, and, you know, and we all do that, right, this is an especially American sin, um, and we, we get into this habit of thinking that it's okay. Um, it's not, I mean, all sin is equal. I mean, it's, it's just as black and as dirty and ugly as the most licentious act or uh, the, the greatest murder, right? And it's just as bad because, I mean, even if physically it doesn't equate to these things, it can even lead to it, right? But, yeah, so that's me. Um, I don't think there's too much else, but thank you. Thank you.